Hey everyone, on this week's episode of the Pre Real Podcast, we're joined by Chad Zdenek. He's the founder and CEO of SQ Properties. Chad was a rocket scientist turned entrepreneur. Unbelievable insights. He really walks you through, and and it was a a real life story of how someone who had no experience in the real estate industry outside of contracting, who was a rocket scientist, gets involved and recently just. 10 years into his career, 12 years into his career, just closed on a $53 million multifamily in Orlando. So from no experience at all to $53 million acquisition on one property, Chad Zdenek, founder and CEO, CSQ Properties. You don't want to miss it. Are you ready to bring your real estate game to the next level? My name is James Prendamano. I'm the CEO and founder of Pre-Real. And over the past 25 years, I've closed over a billion dollars in transactional real estate. Each week, I'm meeting with outstanding investors, high-performing individuals, and visionaries operating in the real estate space. These are the people that are actually out there in the real estate game right now getting it done. This podcast aims at bringing anyone's game to the next level. This is the Pre-Real Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to the Pre Real Pod Podcast. We're joined today by Chad Zdenek. He is the CEO of CSQ Properties and founder. Uh, folks, this is one of the stories that that we wanted to share. We were so excited to to talk to Chad uh, of someone that was involved in the periphery on on the third party side of real estate and transactions, uh, not as an investor, and has gone full tilt in uh, from rocket scientists to a recent acquisition of $53 uh, million multifamily property in Orlando. And, and I'm being literal when I say rocket scientist. Chad, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today, man. I'm really excited to connect with you. You bet. Thanks, James. Glad to be here. Yeah. So, you know, uh, like literally when we say rocket scientist, you work for Boeing. Uh, from what I understand, you, you were a uh, on a, a show on that geo like this was this was your world this was you know what you were doing for a career uh you, you had your gc license you know for 25 years plus where's the pivot for you where's the moment or or what's that story about where you said you know what this isn't for me anymore i want to get into the the real estate side of things sure yeah so i was a uh, structural engineer uh, working for Boeing on the space shuttle main engines program. Uh, I did that for seven years and I uh, did some structural engineering consulting and general um, general contracting construction work as well. Um, and for me, it, it happened the switch when I, I always knew I was an entrepreneur, always knew I wanted to run my own business. And my brother had started a lighting business, uh, which he kind of recruited me over to uh, go work with him on. And uh, it was at the same time, we were actually both at UCLA. So both my brothers were playing football at UCLA. I was getting my MBA at UCLA. So it's kind of rare to have three brothers at UCLA all at the same time. We had one year where we all three of us overlapped. And um, and my MBA, I was focusing on entrepreneurial studies and using my my brother's business as kind of my, my pet project. And uh, and eventually the, bill, the b- business started growing and uh, he recruited me over. So I left Boeing. Um, he promised to uh, to pay me more than he was paying himself. I wound up taking like a 50% pay cut to go work there <laughs> and uh, leaving Boeing and working with NASA and all this, this stuff that, that had a, a pretty good appeal to it. And uh, to just start a, a really, really small company. Um, but we grew that. We grew that to about uh, 75 employees, three different warehouse locations uh, here in L.A., the biggest um, lighting company here in L.A., doing uh, mostly Christmas lighting, event lighting, landscape lighting. And um, and then in 2018, uh, my brother took over, you know, bought me out, took over the business and uh and i'm like i gotta get into real estate finally you know because i we worked with all these really wealthy clients and a lot of them made their wealth from real estate and so my brother and i had wanted to do that for like 10 years to get into it but we just never did and i'm like you know what now's my opportunity i'm gonna jump into this thing full time i started uh csq properties which stands for the challenge status quo and uh and i did it 
and I just started doing my own uh, local syndications here in Long Beach. Um, I was a solo GP uh, doing everything from A to Z and um, and which was really time consuming, a lot of work, but I learned a lot and then uh, and then started partnering with people out of state to do bigger deals. And uh, and that's more or less what I do now. I know you're in New York and, and me here in L.A., you know, a lot of legislative issues, especially during covid. And it's gotten a lot, a lot more difficult from a landlord's perspective. And uh, so right now I'm doing a lot more stuff out of state with with partners. What's the draw? What is the pull to to take you from a company like Boeing taking a 50 percent pay cut in in salary? Uh, why? I mean, candidly, what what was the pull there? Yeah, for me, it's it's really um, who I am as an entrepreneur. I always really, I've always been entrepreneurial. I've started or helped run six different businesses now, and um, and that, that that that's me in in my my true self. And uh, I love Boeing. Um, worked with incredibly bright group of people did some amazing things. So that had appeal from that standpoint, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. And, and so for me, I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to bet on myself. And, um, you know, there's a lot of red tape in these big companies. They do amazing things, but the red tape can be very frustrating, especially for a guy who's got a, an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, so for me, that was the main driver to leave. I've always been okay with risk when I'm betting on myself. And um, yeah, I took a huge pay cut, but then in the end, wound up doing way better and uh, just took a little time to get there. Uh, what are some of the things that you've seen come down the pipe out there, Chad, that that for you guys was, okay, we, we need to start placing our dollars in other states? Yeah. Well, and, and before I get there, I think it's important to realize you're right. I totally agree. They they have good intentions of passing this legislation, but with all good intentions, there's unintended consequences. And that's really what is the heart of, of what's driving our decisions <laughs> between you and I. We're coming to the same decisions in, in two different uh, parts of the country, opposite parts of the country for that matter. Um, so, so for me, you know, uh, going through COVID, owning properties here in Long Beach, um, I'm under the jurisdiction of the county of LA, not the city of LA. It was very intentional for me not to do syndications in the city of LA, although I, I do own my own investment properties uh, in the city of LA. I did not syndicate those or bring other investment money into that uh, in part because of, of some of those uncertainties. Um, but it's brutal. I mean, we, we still have in L.A., we still have an eviction moratorium going on right now. Uh, right now, it's slated to end the end of January 2023. As we're filming this in the fall of 2022, it's still it's still going on. And the city of L.A. just passed a rent freeze that's going to continue on through all of 2023. So, like, you have, you know, the it's really almost become a misnomer about, about property rights, right? They're, I mean, they really in, in have, have impacted property rights. So they say, okay, you can't, you can't raise rents, right, for, for four years, right? But what have they done to your maintenance costs? What have they done to any of your, your, pers your property management expenses, right? Construction expenses. None of that's capped. The only thing they've capped is... The, the profit side of, of your income statement. And the expense side, is, as, as we all know, has been going crazy with inflation. And so they're, they're literally tying the hands of property owners, um, which, which in, my, in my, my opinion is not right. And um, I don't feel comfortable investing my money in that sort of situation. Certainly don't want to bring other people into that. And uh, so we're investing in business-friendly states, states like the, most of the country is right now. There's a reason why these states are booming. And, um, and that's where we're putting our investment dollars. And it is going to have unintended consequences for these areas where in, investments are leaving. From what I understand, the percentages out your way are startlingly high 
of folks who have actually stopped paying rent. Like I'm hearing 30, 40 plus percent of renters are not paying rent anymore. Well, and, now, and it's gotten worse, by the way. The first 14 months of COVID, I had zero missed rent payments. 14 months, not a single missed rent payment, right? The rest of the world, uh, the rest of the, the country, at least, is coming out of COVID at that time. And, and now you have more and more tenants that are claiming COVID hardship, which is really, it's a, it's a verbal claim. There, there has to be, there doesn't need to be any documentation in terms of a COVID hardship. You just have to attest to it. And, uh, and, they, and then that's when COVID um, rent collection issues got worse was after that, you know, for me, it was 14 months. Some people saw it earlier. Some people saw it maybe a little bit later, not much. Most people started seeing it get a lot worse in that year and a half time frame to where we're still dealing with it now. So you've got, you've got um, a, a high number of job openings, right? You've got unemployment low with, with huge number of job openings and people still claiming, a, a making, making a verbal attestment that they have a COVID hardship. They don't need to describe what that really means. And then they don't have to pay the, they're not, they're not liable for paying that rent right now. Um, and, and it's the landlords that are left holding the bag. So the ability to acquire real estate in some of these secondary and tertiary markets, we feel like this may be the, the greatest opportunity we've ever seen where pricing as the markets shift and we head into challenging economic times now, we don't believe we're going to see that huge drop off in some of these secondary and tertiary markets. Has that been part of your, your strategy and mindset also? I agree 100 percent, 100 percent. And and I, I've actually done some talks on this Um especially earlier on, like before COVID, I was a big primary market guy exactly for the reasons you're talking about. And I would I would preach that real estate runs on 10-year cycles and people have seven-year memories. And they forget <laughs> how clobbered these secondary and tertiary markets got. So I'm I'm investing in Long Beach. I'm investing in LA, SoCal, right? Like, like a solid primary market. That was all before COVID. And a lot has changed because of COVID. And and I think, and the time will tell, but I think it's going to be a lot stickier than, than what maybe people initially thought when we were a year into this thing. And, and by that, I mean, people are moving to where they want to live and working remotely and, and forcing companies to figure out how to deal with a remote workforce. It might not be 100% remote workforce, but there is an element uh, that companies are dealing with, and uh, and it's not it's not changing. So, I'm a I'm a member of a, a group called the Entrepreneurs Organization. It's a seventeen thousand person uh, organization worldwide. I was actually president of my chapter last year, and uh, it's all million dollar and above businesses to be a part of EO. And um, and I, so I'm dealing with these people. There's there's 170 people between LA and LA North, 170 business owners that that I interact with on a regular basis. And these business owners are being forced to learn to deal with a remote workforce. And um, I think that's going to bode very well for these secondary and tertiary markets. And what would normally happen on a downturn where they do get clobbered and they, they wind up go, dropping farther than a primary market and they stay down lower than a primary market, I think that story has shifted a bit. And, and for me, I'm a lot more open to looking and investing in these secondary and tertiary markets because I think these migration patterns that we're seeing are going to stick. People aren't going to just all of a sudden decide, okay, now I'm going to move back or now I'm going to go back to the primary core where I was before. Like that's, that's not going to happen. So I think that the uh, these secondary and tertiary markets are going to be insulated a lot more than they ever have been in the next downturn. What are your requirements on the debt side of things, rate locks, uh, considering the market and where this is headed? What 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 do you want your deals to look like now to be strong enough to endure and get to, if you will, the other side of the rainbow? Yeah, and there there's a lot of clouds before you get to the other side of the rainbow. Yep. Um, 
I mean, this is this is a very very tough market for debt. So, uh, a couple of things that I would uh, suggest to to your listeners: um, the first is you got to have a backup plan. And um, what I'm seeing right now out there is there's a lot of retrades on the debt. And uh, by retrades, I mean okay, you get an LOI from from your lender, you know, two months before you're going to close, and then they change it the week of the close. Like, I mean, this is like a disastrous, disastrous uh, issue to deal with. Um, not so much if you have a plan B, but you got to you got to really button up your plan B. Um, the amount of deals I'm seeing retraded on the debt, like literally um, you could have like, I mean, we, we've had it right. So on another deal, we had a, um, a third, 30, 35 million dollar debt. Um, from a bank, it might've been a 72% LTV, something like that. And the week of close, they, they, they reduced it by 2 million bucks. Right. Okay. So maybe it's like 8%, you know, okay. 8% drop. Okay. It's still 2 million, $2 million that the GP team's got to come up with. Otherwise you're not closing. And then you got to go talk to the seller and how much money do you have hard on your EMD money? Like it's a disaster. So for me, I'm looking at having um, gap funding or short-term uh, hard money set up ahead of time so that if that does happen, that you've already got your, your secondary lenders kind of comfortable with the deal, comfortable with the GP team, and you can pull that trigger a little bit faster. Like, like to me, that that's key. Um, you mentioned briefly about having rate caps. That's mandatory, um, but very, very expensive. Um, so we had, we had a, uh, $600,000 rate cap just for two and a half points, uh, cost us 600 grand. Whereas a year ago, that probably would have cost us 50. So you got to have these, these rate cap numbers in your underwriting because it's huge. And, but you can't, you can't do it without a rate cap. Like, like who knows where these rates are going. So you, you really want to have a rate cap, um, most recently, something that we're doing that's pretty interesting, sellers are always you know, notorious for coming around a little bit slower than the buyers, right? In terms of a downturn, right? They always see it last. Um, but they're starting to see it a little bit. So one of the things we're doing on, on two properties uh, that we got under contract in Florida right now is uh, we're actually approaching the sellers to do some carryback financing. So we're doing a, a 50% LTV with the bank. So the bank's happy with that. They're first in position. And then doing a 25% carry back uh, with the seller um, at a modest interest rate, maybe four or 5%. Mm -hmm. And um, and telling the, the seller like, hey, you want your price. We can do that price, but you got to have some, some seller financing here. You got to carry back some of this loan. And by the way, we want it at 4%. If you don't like that, that's okay. I understand. If you want, you know, six percent, or you don't, you don't want to carry back anything. Well, the price has to adjust because if we stick into our underwriting and we're trying to stick, you know, maybe the returns are a little bit lower, but you got to have some returns. Then the price has to adjust if you're not willing to be flexible there. And um, at least with the last two deals we're looking at, the sellers were, were open to it, and we were able to get four and five percent seller carry back financing for. Um, for 25% and they're second in position. So the bank stays happy. And at a 50% LTV, you got a less likelihood of getting a retrade. So, so that's working pretty good. We're just starting to roll that out. And, uh, but you got to watch the debt. I mean, that, that, that's a critical piece right now in this really, really uncertain uh, market we're in. How long are you shooting for in your rate locks? How long do you think you need to be locked in for to get through these these difficult times? Yeah. And look, that's the that's the million dollar question, right? Because you could rate lock, you could do a five year rate lock, but you're gonna pay a five year rate lock. You know, like yep. your numbers, your numbers aren't really going to pencil out if you're if you're being that conservative. Um so, so it's just like anything else. It's I think it's walking that fine line between you know uh, how long of a rate lock you're going to have, or or how low is that ceiling going to be? 
because you know the more conservative you want to be, the cost can get really, really high. So, so there is going to be some element of of risk that we're still having. So, like for us, we're doing like two to three year rate locks. Um, we're trying to have more favorable options on, on the debt. Um, if you have a you know three plus one or whatever it might be for bridge financing, um, to really try to negotiate some of those options up front. But uh, and and so we, okay, so we got to understand we are going to have some element of risk. We're not going to purchase that ele- that risk away because it would the deal wouldn't make sense. But I come back to a, a comment you made earlier about the housing shortage that we're in right now, right? I I believe we are in a housing shortage. Actually, everyone believes it. The question is by how much. So so if you have let's say four to six million units. Some really conservative estimates might say 1 million units that we're short, but we're short units, right? But what's happening right now? You have builders that aren't building anymore. They're slowing down again at the exact wrong time to be slowing down. So you have inflation that's going on. You have rents that are that are still going up really high, especially in these markets that we're talking about. And inflation is, is driving that. And you have builders that are slowing down. So this is a this is it's not a good recipe for for uh, for rent renters or for homeowners for that matter, um, but for investors it's really good, right? So we, we we're having a built-in hedge one on inflation because rents are increasing and two on inventory because builders are slowing down and we we're already short, right? We're we're in this mess because of what happened in 08. Builders stopped stopped uh, building. And our 40-year average was was below for 10 years before we got back up to the 40-year average. That's that's why we're left with these four to six million units short. So so that problem's not going away anytime soon. And those two things I think bode very well for for investors. So what I'm doing is okay. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market right now, but we've got two major major tailwinds um, that we can ride for a really long time. And if we're able to negotiate a little bit better right now, either on on pricing from the seller or on some of the seller back finance, uh, seller carry back financing, like let's let's run with it. Let, you know, let's use this market to negotiate the terms. We try to mitigate some of the risk, like we're talking about, but lock these properties up because it's going to take a long time for inflation to come back down. And as as you know, James. These prices are sticky, right? Once they yeah. go up, it's very, very hard for them to come down, if at all. So I think anybody who's locking up property right now, they're going to do very well in the long term. Uh, how do how do you do it? How do you go about pulling together the team? You're you're a contractor by trade uh, initially, uh, and you know what that's like, right? You, you've got your your team, you've got your people on the ground in in SoCal, but that's not helping you out in Kansas, where I know you have some holdings down in Orlando. Uh, how do you how do you bridge those those miles literally? Yeah, and and that's a that that is a, a pretty serious issue, especially for a guy like me who's who's an engineer, and I like to really know what's going on and and have my hands and everything. It can be a bit limiting at times, um, but for me, I think I see it as two main ways or two main things that that need to be done. Uh, one is is you really got to grow your network. Um, for me, I've been to almost twenty different conferences this last year. Um, so I'm, I'm traveling a lot, meeting people, spending a lot of face-to-face time with potential partners. Uh, I'm always, always evaluating and, and quote unquote, interviewing partners, like always, you, you've got to be doing that. And, um, uh, because these are people that, that you're going to be putting a lot of, lot of trust in. And the question isn't, isn't, is something going to go wrong with the property or deal? The question is, what is it going to be? There's always something that goes wrong with the property, right? That's not the question. So, so the question is, is how are you going to deal with it? How's your team going to deal with it? And, and for that, you got to have a lot of trust and you really got to know your partners pretty well. So for me, conferences and traveling is, is pretty paramount to, to connecting those dots uh, the second part of that would be uh, joining mastermind groups. I've had a lot of luck um, joining mastermind groups. I'm a part of the real estate guys uh, inner circle. Um, 
and I've partnered with a, a guy from there. Um, and it's, it's been great just having, having that kind of that mastermind network. Cause you, you instantly have a level of trust set up. If someone's in your mastermind group, uh, like they basically have to sabotage themselves in that group if they're going to kind of go sideways on you on a deal, right? It's more than just me on a deal because they're a part of this group. Uh, I'm also part of um, Hunter Thompson's group, Raise Masters, and uh, looking to partner with some people in, in that group. So I think if you can join a mastermind, it, you know, it's going to cost you some money, but think of it as an investment. Um, you're definitely going to have to invest in yourself. Um, but these these are groups that can really help compress time frames in terms of getting to that point where where you can really trust somebody and and start doing deals together. And those two between conferences, networking, I, ca- I count that as one, but conferences and mastermind groups, those are the two main ways that I, I'm trying to accelerate these partnerships. Because, I mean, look, I know what it's like running a deal, right? I, I, I've done it from A to Z. I would never touch it outside outside of my my circle here, right? My geographical area. I Literally, I'd be at the property every, every weekend. And um, I'd be doing my investors a disservice if I had to do that. So, so if you have partners, that's really how you can you can really take down bigger deals and uh, and do them out of state, which for me is a, a win win right now. Uh, tr- tremendous. What, what are some um, what are some things folks can invest if they wanted to reach out and connect with CSQ um, on the investment side? What do the parameters look like? Yeah, I mean, look, I think a, a great way to get into this business for some of your listeners that that might be newer to it or kind of dipping their toe in the water here, I think a great way is to go as a limited partner, right? I mean, that's like how I started doing deals. And so you got to have some capital. Okay, you got to save up some money. But to go in as a limited partner, you follow the deal, you, you're evaluating deals, you're learning about it, and you don't have any of the risk like on your own shoulders, right? You don't have other people's money on your shoulders, which is a, a very big burden, uh, responsibility, probably better word. Um, so investing as an LP in other people's deals is a great way to do that. And I, and I do that with my own money. Um, of course, I invest in my own deals, um, but, but I think going in as an LP is a great way to do it. Um, you know, typically 75 K sometimes as low as 50, maybe as high as a hundred, but 75 K is a pretty common number right now. Um, so you do have to have some capital, but you learn a lot that way. Uh, for us at CSQ properties, um, you know, you can take a look at what we're doing, uh, website, csqproperties.com or LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and, uh, and really, And this isn't just for CSQ, but for anybody, just start following them, start listening to them, start learning about what they're doing um, and really getting comfortable with that that person or that group ahead of time. Because it's not something you're going to do in a weekend, right? It's not like you're going to binge watch YouTube and all these podcasts and stuff to figure out who you want to invest with. It takes a lot of time. And, uh, And sometimes you learn most about like problems that have happened. And I, I know it's not very common. We don't like to talk about our problems, but <laughs> you get on some good podcasts and, and we can talk about problems here, but but you can find out uh, find out what their problems have been. And like I mentioned before, the question isn't what uh, when is there going to be a, or what if there will be a problem. The question is when there will be a problem or what is the problem? Because there's always problems. I, I know, James, you <laughs> your deal is you guys have run into problems, right? Um but the astute, the astute um, student or investor isn't really going to care about about the problems per se. But like, what did you do about the problems, right? How did you mitigate the risk? How did you handle it as a team, right? And and how did you limit the downside of that problem? Those are all the really important questions that really can help you vet a, a good operator. Yeah, the great insight. Um, anyone who tells you, folks, in this game that their operation is seamless and they, they don't have those problems either is completely lying or doesn't have a close enough eye on the portfolio. That's what distinguishes us as, as operators. That's what separates the, the good from the great. Uh, and we won't go the other way, but 
that that's what it is, is how you deal with these problems. They come up every day, every hour. Sometimes that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what it's about, right? Is, is you, if you're not a problem solver at your core, this isn't the industry for you. And uh, I think your advice of jumping in as a limited partner um, and asking questions, uh, I think a lot of people get intimidated uh, and they don't realize like this industry, at least with my experience, everybody has been remarkably helpful, friendly. Um, these mastermind groups are a great idea. People want to um, to share their experiences, their knowledge. Uh, they want you to share and, and bring value also, of course. But um, I've found it to be just a really wonderful community. And, uh, you know, we're having a hell of a time with it. And this new new digital world uh, has connected folks like you and I that otherwise wouldn't have had that opportunity. And, you know, you never know what's around the next corner, man. Yeah. Yeah. You you, you mentioned before, the, I have, I've got a show on National Geographic called Inside Mighty Machines. And one of my side hustles, I, I host TV shows. And and I'll t- I've been doing that for like 12 years now. And I'll tell you, like Hollywood, like you hear about Hollywood, like I don't like being part of Hollywood. I, yeah. I love when I'm working and, and hosting and that stuff. I love it. But as an industry, like I can't trust anybody. Like I'm, I'm sorry if my, if my agent is listening to this, but <laughs> besides my agent, like I can't trust anybody. They'll tell you yeah. one thing and then they totally do something different. And And I'll tell you now that I've been networking so much in real estate, Real estate is is totally different than that, um, especially on the syndication side, the operator side. Like we really want to help each other out. We find new partners, and you're constantly working with different groups. Like it's such a better environment than Hollywood, and, and for me, it's been a, a, a breath of fresh air because uh, just like you, James, like I can call you up and say, "Hey, James, you know, I, I saw you were doing these out of, out of New York New York State deals. Like, how's that been for you?" And like you'll talk to me, you'll tell me. The low down and dirty. I know you're going to be honest with me. I would do the same thing for you. And I find that uh, that syndicators are just really out there to to help each other out and uh, an open book. And uh, to me, that's just it's been great because it's a lot different than Hollywood. Uh, can you give me one or two suggestions, books, podcasts, anything that you think would be helpful uh, for folks either starting out now or as they're preparing to adapt their strategy for what's ahead? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it kind of depends on their journey. You know, we all hear about uh, Robert Kiyosaki's, um, you know, book is is key. Uh, a lot of his books are, are really good. Um, he's a great place to first start if you're, let's say, like a W-2 person and thinking about investing out, out outside of your world, if you will, or stocks and bonds. Um, I think that's great. Uh, for me personally, I've gotten a lot out of uh, the real estate guys. They put on about six or seven conferences a year, in-person conferences. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of a groupie at this point. I go to all of them. Um, and multiple times, by the way. So so th- there's one that they put on called The Secrets of Successful Syndication. They do it twice a year. I've gone four times. Um, a really great spot. Uh, one, to kind of learn the ropes of this business. But two, just to meet other really good operators, they get about 350 people a year over there. Um, so I, I think that's that's a, a solid way to kind of get up to speed on, on the syndication side of things. Um, the other thing, too, is like listening to podcasts like, like you're doing. You've got some great, great guests on your shows. There's a lot of content out there, YouTube videos, uh, which has been great. Um, and I've, I've learned a lot that way. Uh, as you get more experience, you you might be a little bit more discerning about uh, about the content you hear. Like, well, that's not quite my experience. So some of that will take a little while to kind of get to that level, but it's a great place to start. And I've I've learned tons that way. Beautiful, uh, Chad. What's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? Uh, really, csqproperties.com or uh, you know any of the social media channels for for. Uh, for CSQ Properties, uh, email would just be info at csqproperties.com. Well, really appreciate the time, man. Best of luck. Cool. Thanks for having me on, brother. Appreciate it. Now, my pleasure. As always, everyone out there, please stay safe. Mm-hmm.